Okay, so this is uh, getting started with functional programming in F Sharp. Uh, my name is Reed Evans. Um, my blog is readevans.tech, and you can find me on Twitter at Reed and Evans. Uh, once again, the code for all of this that we'll be seeing here in a bit, uh, you can find at the tiny URL. Uh, so a little bit about me real quickly. Um, so I am the founder of Functional Knox. So I said I was from Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a local functional programming kind of meetup there. I work for a company called the Tombers Group. Uh, we do a lot of work for companies like Daimler and ESPN and McDonald's and Michelin, Coca-Cola, a lot of different companies. Um, you know of stuff we've done probably because we invented the term Chicken McNugget. Right? So uh, if I'm a little bit closer to home, there are other things I use but Chicken McNugget. So, <laughs> an overview of what we're going to go into. Um, so basically we're just going to do a short intro to F Sharp. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to actually get into building like a, a real world uh, blaba. Does everyone know blaba, the term blaba? So it is a boring line of business application. Um, that's what I deal with most of my time is, is you know, talking with databases and getting stuff out and uh, dealing with models and that sort of thing. So, uh, so these are some of the things that we're going to go over. Uh, discriminated unions, um, you've probably heard a lot this week, but it's probably been called a sum type. For whatever reason, F Sharp wants to call it a discriminated union, uh, but it's the same thing. So let's just go over some syntax real quick. Um, so it comes from like an ML kind of background. So if we want to declare a value, I said value, not variable, um, let one equals one. So in other words, that outputs one, so we're good. If we want to declare a function, well, we can declare a function called add five that takes an X and returns X plus five. Yes, you could have also said add five equal parens plus five if you wanted to. Uh, we can call that function add five space three, which would get eight. Is this making sense? All good? Usually this is to an object-oriented conference and <laughs> or when I'm giving this, so this I, I usually take a little bit more time here. Uh, so anyway, so we've got the uh, using a pipeline operator too. So um, Elm has this, a few other languages have this. F Sharp didn't invent it, but it was right there on the cusp, cusp of inventing it. So we could call that same function by saying three pipe forward add five. And it's the exact same thing as we had here. So it just inverts the, the, the order. But I find that if you are explaining it to someone who has been uh, doing a lot of object-oriented code, if you have this add five function here that takes an integer, which is what this does, and you do it this way, add five almost starts to look like an extension method on ints, right? Because it almost looks like three dot add five if you were coming from a C sharp or a Java kind of background. Um, so that kind of, kind of works. We can also add five with the one variable that we, or the one value that we assigned earlier, and that gets us a six. Uh, multi arc function, um, which as we've learned in this conference already, there is no such thing because this is an auto query language, but this is the way that, it would, that you could write it. So you could add X and Y, and it would be X plus Y, obviously. So add two, five is seven. Um, add two and five is, of course, an error because um, it has to be an integer. So I'll put this slide up here to show that it is in fact statically typed. Um, it is just using type inference, similar to what Haskell or some of these other uh, languages are going to use. Um, so just because I'm not defining the types like I would have to do in a C-sharp or a Java or something where we have to explicit type, in this case we're getting implicit types and we're getting all the value of that. Uh, if we want to declare a record type, uh, we can call a type of person and that person has a first name, which is a string, and then we can create that. So we can say Tom is a person who has a first name of Tom. And if we run this through the REPL, we'll get back that we have a person record and their first name is Tom. Uh, it is white space sensitive. So the top line, that is an error um, because it's gonna tell you that you haven't finished the uh, let binding uh, in line two. Um, but as you see, six and seven is good and nine and 10, that's also good. Um, so it's white space sensitive. You have to have spaces. So most of the editors, if you have any kind of, if you do any of the F sharp plugins or whatever, it'll substitute your tabs for spaces. All right, so a question, what is the value of X? <laughs> so you are all, see, this, is, this would have been better at the very beginning of the conference before everyone already knows the answer to this. All right, so let x equal one, uh, x, and, and what I've got here is this the way that the REPL would spit this out. So it lets you know that you have a value called x, and it's an int of one, 
And obviously, five, uh, line 4 x equals x plus 1 is, of course, false because mathematically that's not possible. The only way you can do addition and make that work is with 0, right? All right, so let me not do that. Let me close out and let's actually go back to some code here. So uh, the rest of the talk, we're going to do this. We're going to actually build some stuff up and it looks like I've got plenty of time. All right. So one of the things that we're going to be building today, we're going to build a thing that deals with managing locations, right? Location is an easy concept. Um, here we have it modeled. That's way up there. Um, so here we have it modeled. So type location and that's obviously a record type. It has a city and a string. Uh, parameters or, or properties and, and both of those uh, a city and a state and they're both strings so then we can create um, we can actually create it here with our let boulder so what I'm gonna do uh, this is the atom plugin so I'm gonna FSI uh, actually, I'm just gonna alt enter because that works and so what we see here is that I've executed our type location so I've executed lines 3 through 6 that are highlighted here and we've sent that to the REPL, and so now that's in our REPL, so we can deal with it. Uh, and then what I can do is, of course, I can hit say here, and then we create a record. So in this case, we're creating a new record, so it's of type location, and it has a city is Boulder, state is Colorado. All good? So if we move to the next one, the next thing that we would want to do, and so we're going to call this, uh, we're going to call this our domain, right? It's very simple, but we've got 30 minutes. so. Uh, this is our domain, and then um, what we're going to do, one of the things you might want to do, obviously, in, a, in all good blobbers, we access a SQL database. So um, the top bit, the R, that's just a way of including a, a, a library, basically. Uh, but what this is going to do is this is actually using um, one of the coolest features of the F-sharp language, which is known as a type provider. Does anyone here have experience with type providers already? Awesome. Um, so what we're going to do, so here I'm just pulling in these things, system and F-sharp or whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my connection string, uh, which thankfully I did as a trusted one rather before I posted this to GitHub. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to call this, uh, we're going to create this function called get locations. So get locations, and it takes the little uh, open close parens. That's uh, saying that what that's accepting is unit, which is essentially the one and only argument that it ever can be is unit. It's just, if I did not include that, this would actually make this like a constant, basically. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and execute that, okay? And so what we see here is that I've got a new query um, that is of type uh, SQL command provider, and there's my query, right? Select star from locations, okay? Well, we don't see anything too crazy about this yet, right? So let me do, so if I call get locations, then what I get back is I get a list of uh, list of stuff way down here on the bottom. So uh, we've got Knoxville, Chattanooga, Huntsville, Asheville. Okay. Um, but you notice that these are like parameterized, right? So we've got ID equal to, city equal Knoxville, state equals whatever. So what actually the type provider is doing for us is that at compile time, actually, well, yeah, at compile time, it's going out and validating and getting the types that would be returned from the SQL server for this query. So it automatically knows what those are. And what I think is even cooler is if I change that, my code no longer compiles because location is not a valid table in my, in my uh, SQL database. Right? I didn't have to run this code. I didn't have to write some sort of an integration test or anything. This happens at compile time. So in here, what I'm showing is just one instance of a type provider. And in this case, it's a specific one for uh, writing SQL commands. I like writing SQL in SQL. There are some, uh, there, there are type providers to abstract that out where you're not actually writing SQL um, if you want to use more of like an ORM kind of approach. Um, but the cool thing is that compiles so we know it's there. So we can get all of our locations and we can see them down here. Well this is awesome but if we're going to write something that is going to be this business app Probably what we want to do is rather than taking this type that gets created, because if we actually look at the type right here, that's kind of nasty. And so probably what we'll want to do is let's map that. Everyone knows map now, right? Um, what we're going to do, we're going to call the exact same thing. And what we're going to do is then instead of 
just returning because uh, in the last one we would have just had the execute. Now what we're going to do is we're going to map and we're going to pass a lambda. And so in the lambda here, if we were to start typing to prove that it is strongly typed, x dot, and now I have every property that would have been returned from the select star. So to prove that this is not lying, what I could do is I could say select ID city from locations. And now my code breaks because I'm trying to access x.state. But x.state wasn't returned from that result set, so it's not valid in this case. Does this make sense? This was, I didn't get this the first time I saw someone show this. And when I actually started using it, it kind of blew my mind that this is an external data source that has nothing to do with our types and our type system, but that I can compile at compile time, I can validate that that external data source's type system is going to map with ex match exactly what I have in my code. So it saves a whole class of errors of, you know, I named it something other than city or whatever, and then I'm trying to parse that through some deserializer using reflection or whatever else, depending on the language construct you have. Um, so basically what we'll do here is we're going to get the result of that. We're going to map that through. And so if we run this now, then we get our function back and we can call get locations again. And when we get it now, you see that we have a sequence of location objects. So val it is uh, the colon sequence of locations. So now this is a sequence of locations. If you're familiar with uh, C-sharp but haven't seen F-sharp too much, sequence is essentially uh, I enumerable. Um, so it's going to be you know, lazily, lazily evaluated, um, which is actually why you see the dot, dot, dot in bracket at the very bottom. Because it's like, hey, I'm going to spit out the first little bit of this just as a help, helper for printing. So then probably what we'll also want to do in our, in our uh, business app is we're going to want to be able to insert data as well, right? So we still have um, our connection string, we've got our location, and now what we have is we're using the SQL command provider again, but we're going to insert something. So this shows another really cool benefit of, of using these uh, to solve business problems. Because if you'll notice what I have, I have use command and then we're inserting into locations the city and state fields with city and state values. So if I call command.execute and open paren, I don't know if you can see this, but it basically tells me that it takes two arguments and that, the, that one is, has to be, a, and that they both have to be strings and it returns an int. And the int is just the number of rows that it updated, right? So what it's done is it's actually gone out and saw what, uh, and seen what it actually had to take in. So here I've got city and state, obviously, if I tried to make this one, this also fails because it's protecting me against that. Question? Um, do I have such a thing like uh, named parameters? So I would say because uh, right now all the parameters are strings. Yes. It's very easy. Yeah, yeah you can, you can, I'm pretty sure you can do that with this one. Um, there are other ways to do it. Um, I've actually got a blog post on my blog that talks about using like a single case sum type to handle that as well. Um, so you can do it that way. Let's see if that'll actually work. Oh, yeah, you might be right. Yeah, so you bring up a good point is that, yeah, I believe that there's a syntax for it. I'm not exactly sure what it is at this point. Yeah, no, 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 but that's a very good point, and that is one, that is one thing that you do have to watch out for is that if I had said, instead of location, let's say on my insert function here, I said city state, and then in the bottom I applied state city or whatever, then you could get some oddities there too. That's correct. All right, so then um, if we pull this stuff in,
And then we do that and it fails because it couldn't insert to the database. But It should be right here. Well, this works when I'm not in front of an audience. So, <laughs> the whole point of doing it this way was to show you that it actually does work. Um, but anyway, you see, the, you see the point right where, when we're actually doing this stuff and uh, the, the SQL that we have that, that is talking to external is gonna be type checked for us. So then, what we've done so far has just been very, very simple. What we probably will end up having is some sort of a business layer, business tier, business whatever. This is where if you were in an object-oriented language, you probably have a class that does this that might have, might take some arguments or, so, you know, if you're doing dependency injection or something like that, right? So we can do the same thing. We can define a function here called state is Colorado. Right. And so that function takes a location and it returns a Boolean. So the boolean that it returns is that the location state is CO. So then what we could do is we could uh, rewrite our insert location with checks, or we could write location with checks now, to actually take a location. Let's see if this works with our rewritten insert here. And then if we try to do that, we get an exception. Because the location that I tried to insert had San Francisco and the state of California. Now, what's the problem with that? Can anyone tell me what the type of insert location with checks is? Because in, in, at first, what it looks like is it's essentially going to take a location and it's going to return an int. But does it? Is that a true type? Is that the true type of this function? See, I, I don't think it is. And here's why I think it doesn't. Because we're throwing an exception here, right? So what this means to me is that it takes a location and sometimes it's going to insert a state and sometimes it's going to throw an exception. And really throwing an exception is not a lot different than a go-to. Um, because it's going to halt the execution of your code where it is. It's going to go to some other places in the code that you've already predefined and you're never sure where that's going to be. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a, it can be a dangerous road to go down. So what we can do instead is in our uh, state is Colorado function, uh, we can change that to if the location's state is Colorado, then we return some of the location, else we return none. So we've all seen maybe so far at this conference, probably, right? So we either have some of the location or none. So if you were in Haskell, you would call this just uh, else nothing. Um, but F-sharp does it a little different because I don't know why, but it does. Um, so then in our let insert location with checks down here, we can accept the location and we can do the match with. So this is very similar, this is just a pattern match. So we're gonna match this, uh, I've got fewer code with some ligatures, so that's just forward pipe, but my font is making it look like a, a cool little triangle. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're matching that, and so then if that result returns some of whatever location, then we're going to return sum of an insert of a location, else we're going to do, we're going to return none. But that's kind of ugly, right? Okay. Yeah. I, have to put, I have to put intermediate slides in. Actually, the question about this section is not about this one. Oh, okay, sure. So, uh, there is, those exceptions are checked or not checked? Or there is no... It's .NET, so it's not checked exception. So if you're coming from Java to, uh, from the JVM to, to .NET, yeah, the exceptions are not checked. Um, yeah, so we can do this. So we can manually write this, this match statement. So in this match statement, what are we doing? We're saying there's a function that we want to call if the result of this match expression is sum, and if it's none, we don't want to do anything. Does anyone know what that function's called? Map, right? So it's the exact same map that we saw before, difference being, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the difference being that in this case we're going to be on the option module instead of the sequence module. So we don't have type classes, so we have to tell uh, the language which context we're in. 
Um, in this case, we're in the option context, uh, line 29 here, uh, so rather than being in the sequence context. So if we wanted to map over a list, we would call sequence.map. If we want to map over an option, we call option.map. Correct. So compiler can't understand it's an option and not sequence? Correct. Because it doesn't have type classes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And yeah, so you have to actually explicitly say that. Of course, it's going to tell you right here that status Colorado returns an option. But correct. Yeah, you can't just say like status Colorado fmap insert. Um, and then so you see what I'm doing here is I'm taking the location, I'm popping that into status Colorado, popping that into option map insert. That could be written points free as well. Um, if we didn't, if we drop the location in the argument. So we could also say so that could also then equal, you know, status Colorado. And that would be the exact same thing if we wanted to write it points free and not actually take in the argument. Because essentially what this does is this returns a function that accepts a location. So it's basically the same thing, it's just written in a different way. Does that make sense? Questions? No? Okay, right on. So let's say that we get to that point in our application and the business person comes to us and says, well, that's great and all, but we also want people to specify locations by latitude and longitude. And you're like, oh, well, we've already written all this other code, and I've already got this abstraction, and it's already picked, and it's, and it's working. You know, we've, we've got provable code out there. So what are you going to do, right? Are we going to rewrite our, all of our abstractions? Well, in this case, what I'm showing is you, you may not have to do that, okay? So... All of the code that we have actually up above here, this is all the same code that we have before, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a type of complex location, which is a sum type, right? So it's either going to be a city state of a location, which means there's a city state constructor that accepts a location, or it's going to be a lat long of double double for Cartesian coordinates, lat long, whatever. Actually, this has happened a lot. <laughs> a lot of people are doing this double double kind of thing. Um, so we can have that type, and then we can create a function called handle complex location. And what that function is going to do is it's going to match our location with either city state of x, which x is a location in this case, or lat long, and we're just destructuring the, uh, the tuple there into a latitude and longitude. <clears throat> so in the city state format, all we had to do is destructure the location from city and state, and we can pass that through just like we've always been doing. Okay. But in the lat long state uh, scenario, what we actually need to do then is geocode that latitude and longitude to a location and then call insert location with checks the same thing that we did in city and state. Does that make sense? Yes, question. Um, does match, uh, can match any type? Match can match any type. So it's like that with generic, so anything can be accepted by match in the type. Yeah. Yes, yes. So what I think is really cool about this, if you're in an object-oriented language now and you're dealing with dependency injection and you're thinking this functional stuff is great, but how do I get my dependency injection? Well, it's really it's partial application is what we're doing. So if you notice, what I did here is I called geocode here. I didn't want to write that geocode. You all didn't want to see that, that geocode function, right? Everyone here has written that. So what did I do? I'm writing this thing out. I get to line 39 and I'm like, man, how am I going to get this latitude and longitude? into something that I can use. So I'm like, hey, well, that's going to be some function, and I'm going to call it geocode, right? And so I write geocode here, and of course that fails. So then what do I do? I say, well, we'll put geocode as the first argument in this function. And what happens there? This is what I think is so awesome, is that if I highlight over geocode, it tells me what function definition that I have to write. Because it says I accept a double, and then a double, and then I return a location. So there's no guessing what kind of type that you had to what, what function signature that has to match. The compiler is telling you, because you have taken a lat and a long and you're passing a lat and a long to the geocode function, and then you're piping that into insert location with checks, and we know that insert location with checks has to accept a location, 
then geocode must be a function that accepts two doubles and returns a location. Does that make sense? Like that's a really cool way of doing it, I think. And so we got one more slide here. Um, let's say then at the end of all of this, this thing is up and everything is great and then we get all of this additional uh, traffic coming to our site, right? We gotta get it to scale, right? One of the problems is that what I'm doing here with my insert, insert uh, function here, lines 13 through 19, right? So in this case, I'm just calling command.execute, right? Well, that's a blocking event. So what we want to do is we want to take all of this code and we want to make it all asynchronous code, right? As it turns out, that's really trivial. So we have to change our insert function. So insert still accepts the location. What we do is we wrap it in this async thing. And this async with the curly braces, it's one of the few times you'll see curly braces in this language, actually, uh, well, in record creation. Um, we're wrapping this all in an async computation expression. And then we're using things like return bang. And so what this actually does is it's going to go and it's going to create this use command, which is the same thing that we had before. It's just wrapped in this async computation expression. And what we're going to do is we're going to execute that command called async execute, which is going to return an async. So if you're used to C sharp with the async await and you're passing tasks around and everything you have to have this task bracket or whatever, the return bang actually handles all that for you automatically. So it waits in a non-blocking fashion for this thing to return before it gets to the next portion in the application. What ends up happening is when you end up running that then, handle complex location essentially returns an async of whatever it had returned before. So the only code that we had to change was we had to wrap, uh, for on 13 there, we had to add an async computation expression and we had to use the return keyword to make sure that we know that what we're actually, well, return bang. Um, to actually return that in an asynchronous context. Yes? Can you map and or chain uh, asynchronous Yes. And so if we were actually to do something like that, what, what, what I could actually do, let's say that I wanted to actually do something, um, what I could actually do is say let bang. And anytime you do bang, it's essentially going to call bind. Um, so um, it would actually bind on the, um, the async uh, execution of this. So I could let bang result uh, equal this, and then I could return result. Or if I wanted to, I could deal with result as itself. And of course, it's just an int, so there's not a whole lot of different options that I'm actually going to have with it there. But then you could do chaining of the things to make it look like what you're writing is a very imperative kind of style, but it actually then all comes back up and um, Execute asynchronously. Question. How is, do you have any experience with F sharp on Linux, like as deployment or development? Uh, so actually, I'm on it. <laughs> so it's funny, obviously, I'm on Windows here. This is actually my work laptop that's dual booted. I don't even have Windows at home, and I do it on Linux just fine. Um, apparently, um, Thursday, there was a problem on Mac with Mono, um, but it's absolutely possible. <coughs> uh, any other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you all so much.